we were in negotiations for investing in real estate. They're winning, they're making money. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Real Estate Educators Podcast, where we provide the education you can build on. I am your host, Kevin Amalsh. This is our first one of hopefully quarterly market pulse updates in the Twin Cities. We have a co-host, Mr. Sean Bloomquist, and our very special guest, Mike Jacka, with us today. So I'm going to start by asking Sean if you can quickly introduce yourself for the people that don't know who you are, which is probably nobody. But if you could do that and then uh, introduce Mike, and then let's get started. I want to hear what, what's going on in the, in the market. Sounds good. Well, I am uh, Sean Bloomquist. I'm with Pine Financial Group. Um, I'm kind of the the head of our Minnesota uh, contingent. Um, so anytime you're dealing in in Minnesota with real estate and you're you're dealing with Pine Financial Group at all, you'll be dealing with me in some way, shape, or form. Um, always happy to be on here with Kevin and uh, help give us some insight. Um, like he said, we got a really special guest today, uh, Mike Jacka, who is the head of MinRIA here, the Minnesota Real Estate Investors Association super knowledgeable. Um, we always love bringing him into any events we have or success summit or any of that stuff, because we know he's going to, he's going to deliver with information everybody needs. And, uh, and he's just a great guy to deal with. So welcome, Mike. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean. And how's it going, Kevin? Doing good, man. I, I gotta say, I'm really, really excited for this. I'm thankful that you, you came on. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive in here? Yeah, so I run the Minnesota Real Estate Investors Association. Um, we've been around for a little over 20 years. Uh, we're the largest, one of the largest uh, RIAs in the country. Uh, we're the largest in the Midwest, but we're we're one of the largest in the country. And uh, I work with, actually, I work with about 70 other RIAs around the country. So we got our pulse on what's really going on around the markets and you know, we're able to bring in the best content and best training and the best speakers and, you know, keep up on what's really going on currently with our market so that it helps our members stay on top of things as well. Uh, so it's just really good organization that we've put together. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis for our main general, and then we have uh, smaller subgroups that are, you know, meet throughout the month that are geared toward different specialties within the real estate. And you are the guy when it comes to statistics. Like when I listen to you, it's like, well, I like you really understand what you're talking about, which is why we're so grateful that you came on. Um, so I'm going to get us started here. I, I'm going to share with you both. Um, I got this email gosh, maybe three days ago or something. And it's so funny. It says, Kevin, it's they're trying to recruit me. They said, Kevin, um, the Fed has already penciled in six rate cuts for 2024. Um, it's already penciled in was, was the words that they used. So now is the time to build your mortgage arm of your company. Let us help you build this mortgage business. Set up a call, whatever the call to action was. Penciled in six. I'm not quite sure that's what the Fed said. What, what do you think about Definitely that? not what the Fed said. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you got to remember just um, a minute. Right now we're a couple of weeks, you know, about a week before Christmas, but literally three weeks ago, two and a half, three weeks ago, I think it was December 1st, uh, Jerome Paul came out and said, uh, things aren't going so well or as well as we planned and we're not going to do any, you know, we're going to stay steady for the foreseeable future. That was in a press conference or whatever, then, the, then they have their meeting and two weeks later and they come out and said, well, we're not going to adjust the rates. Um, but we are looking at the possibility of raising rates in the coming year. That's what they said. That's right. That's why you're too. <laughs> instantly, within I swear to God, within an within a half an hour, I had at least 10 people texting me and emailing me saying the Fed's this is great. This is what we've all been waiting for. The Fed's cutting rates. I'm like, wait a minute, I just heard the exact same thing you guys heard, and I did not hear anything about the feds are cutting rates. They said that it, they're, they're looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, he, he, exactly. Mike, he said, you know, we're looking at what I heard, maybe 75 basis points throughout the entire year. So we're looking at possibly three, right? Possibly. But he also said rate hikes are not off the table. Look, unemployment just went down. That's not what you want to see if you're trying to fight inflation. 
So I, I'm with you. And then I, I've seen the surveys. We're, we're at 40%, which is less than 50, 40% of any rate cut in the first quarter of the year anyway. Well, and then within 10 minutes of uh, Jerome Paul's uh, speech the other day, the bond market tanked and it, and it inverted again. Right. Yeah. That's such a good point. So I'm very confused by this. And Sean, I'm curious what you think with what you're seeing and with your clients and all this. But when you when you get good news, like unemployment, strong jobs, uh, high job uh, wage growth, you get news that are actually positive for the economy and you see the markets go down. Like why, why would we, why are we seeing, why are we seeing that do you think? To be honest, I, I'm not really sure why, why it is. Uh, stocks you know, I, stocks went ahead. up, the bonds went down. The bonds is what the, the financial guys are, are looking at. The stocks is what the general public's dealing with. Yeah. You know, so those went up, but that's not an indicator of the market. That's just a response to the market. The right, but we've also money. seen we ought, we've seen the stock market go like significant drops with positive economic news. I think cycle. last week we saw them go up. I think the stock market went up after that because it reacts to that positive news. Right. But the bond markets said, I mean, and I'm not a I don't play in the stocks. I have nothing to do with stocks. I just follow a lot of people that understand them and talk about them. And the news on the street was is that the uh, the 10 and two years inverted again real, real quickly. And within 10 minutes, the bond market should tank. Yeah, which helped interest rates right now. So now we're, we're I don't know what they are this morning, but they, they did drop below. They're, um, yeah, the rates yeah. I was looking at this morning, they're coming in just over 7%, like 7.2. So they're going to be slide six and slow sevens. Yeah, I'm seeing. So the, the average, now I, the, you anywhere you look at, you're going to see the rates anywhere from like 6.2. Eight, I think I've seen it as low as to yeah. like 7.3. I follow one steady, consistent um, resource. That way I'm I'm always following the same trend rather than jumping around from one resource to the other. So the one I follow is bankrate.com because that pulls in the average of everything and then they're displaying it as the average. Right? And that's also they're showing the average for like people with great credit, not poor credit. Mm -hmm. But right as of right now, it's coming in for the 30 year fix is coming in at 7.28. I think I saw the FHA one was coming in at like 7.1, um, something like that. I think that's why it, it did. It looked, sounds like it might have popped up a little bit because it was, it definitely got under seven. But so, Sean, what are you seeing with your clients or with these high interest rates? What are, what are people saying? What are they, what's, what are they feeling? Uh, it, the only the only uh, real thing that I'm noticing is it's it seemed to um, obviously slow the the time you know for them to turn a property. Get, once they get out on the market, it was sitting a little bit longer than it had before. But to be honest, it it doesn't. It, it's actually had an uptick, and and properties are starting to move again a little quicker than expected. You know, after the last few months and how they've been and. Um, even though we've got the end of the year coming up, there there doesn't seem to be, from what I'm seeing with my clients, it doesn't seem to be slowing at all. It's actually getting a little bit of an uptick and, and things are starting to move a little a little more rapidly than they had the last few months. So that's a good sign in my eyes. That's great. Mm -hmm. Is the, are the statistics saying that, Mike? Well, just from this little bit of a move uh, that we had just this, this week, it's too early to tell on that. But as far as... You know, what's what's selling? Yeah, I mean, exactly what Sean just said. Things are still selling. They're selling quickly, just maybe not as quickly as they were a sure. couple months ago. Uh, we're we're not getting. I'm not hearing or seeing multiple offers at the moment. However, with that said, we just sold a property last week, but we sold it on terms on a contract for deed, where we had five offers in one day. But we are offering contract for deed terms on a decent property in the right price range. Mm -hmm. You know, that's still has some indication of consumer confidence, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's well. That's one thing that's interesting, and it's and it's been baffling me because you watch everything else that's what's going on, you would expect the consumer confidence to be down, but I'm not seeing that. Not in the, not when I go out and about. You know, I'm not seeing. I go to the restaurants, that, you know, that are packed, and you you know, you know, if you get there at, you know. 
five, six o'clock in the evening, you're going to be waiting a half an hour to an hour for a table. Mm -hmm. Or lunch, you're going to be waiting for a lunch table, or you're going to get stuck in the back corner someplace. And it, we, it's hard to tell when you go to the, the the stores because people are shopping online more now. And I really noticed that because, like, I have my uh, mailbox at the UPS store, and every time I walk in, there's a line of people walking out with their stuff that they they got delivered to them. Because, and I'm one of them. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to the UPS store, like three times a week to pick up myself and not only am I grabbing my mail I got a package or two that I ordered online you know and then um, I was at uh, a colleague's house the other day to drop off some uh, paperwork and while I'm there Amazon Prime was delivering their groceries for the week and I'm like yeah I order I just order my groceries twice a week now from Amazon it's a, it's the same price and it gets delivered right to me I don't have mm -hmm. to waste my time going shopping yeah so it's it's hard to, to tell that if you go to the actual stores in the mall but I'm definitely not seeing an issue with confidence in everything else that I'm doing. Yeah, I, I a lot of this confuses me, Mike, and I've I've been through a couple of cycles here, but not not that many. And I've tried to study some of the old, you know, like savings and loan stuff, and some of the stuff back in the day where it's much more similar to what we're going through today. But it's still very confusing, and the jobs is what's really tripping me up. We should have already been in a recession, right? Two quarters of negative GDP. That's what we learned in school. Um, and we saw a well, nation, what we saw house values. Do, we did see them come down. Now they've recaptured or they've, they've uh, yeah, recaptured some of that loss. But we saw real estate go down. We saw negative uh, GDP, two quarters, and we saw an inverted yield curve. But what kept the Fed from saying, this is my opinion, I'm speaking on my own behalf here. What kept the Fed from saying we're in a recession is the jobs. Yeah, and that's the that's the wrong way to look at it because what you got to look at it, and I don't know if the Fed's looking at this or or who or not, but it's not the unemployment rate that matters because let's face it, there's a fraction of the number of people that are working today that were working in, in March of 2020. Right? So we have way less people working. Yeah, but that now was than official. 2020. They did announce that as a recession. That was an official recession in 2020, was it? Well, if you want my opinion, we've been in a recession since 2008 and haven't gotten out of it. So <laughs> we're still in it. The Fed's just been pumping it up to make it look like we're not. But if you just look at it from the, from the March of 2020 till now, the jobs numbers haven't even recovered yet. Because so many people now are not working and they don't have to work. So well, you have all the boomers retiring, right? They're all at retirement age now, and we're starting to see that. I think half of them are, are out of the market now. Yes, and you got a whole younger generation that has um, grown up receiving benefits of one sort or another. So, it's, and I know this personally from our other one of our other businesses. Um, we deal with a lot of people um, in. Uh, I don't want to. Say I don't want to, you know, sound um, sound degrading, <laughs> but there are a lot of people that. So there's one of our other businesses is, is a people to people business. It's not you know real estate. Uh, it's just a side hustle that uh, my girlfriend has, and we noticed a big transition in their spending behaviors and their work behaviors. Most of these people had full time jobs or worked a couple part time jobs prior to COVID hitting so prior to march 2020 since then because they started getting all the money they literally started they learned how to receive all the benefits and we have and we were actually just talking about this about a month ago it's what we're this is uh we're almost four years or three and a half you know three and a half years in yep. half of those people are still not working yet and have no reason to no desire to go back to work because they're still loving off the system. They're now getting wealth, um, welfare support. They're getting food support. They're going to these charitable organizations. And they they literally created this coalition and they're sharing information on where to get all these free benefits and, and get people to pay for the utilities and, and get all this free money. And this whole system has gone up. So you got a lot of people that have done that. That's one thing. The other thing is I've noticed too with, with the real estate entrepreneurs, we're entrepreneurial. 
And a lot of these people that had full-time jobs prior to 2020, March 2020, are not back to work, but they started a side hustle. And so they're doing more entrepreneurial stuff. So that's taken a lot of people out of the workforce, and nobody wants to talk about that. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. Yeah, so I don't know why everyone's all focused on the unemployment rate. There's, I don't see how the unemployment rate can go actually high because we are underemployed. We need more employees. That's the other problem I see in most places I go is they always say, you know, they, and there's still signs in the window saying, please be patient. We are short staffed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my girlfriend's son is a manager at a McDonald's and they're struggling to get anybody to come in. So if somebody gets sick, they're in trouble. Because they did, nobody will come in to fill in a position. So I, I read a report, gosh, it was just this morning actually, um, about this. And it's just basically the Fed's projections, right? So we know that the target is 2%. That's the PCE core, the core PCE numbers, what they're targeting, 2%. They don't have to get the 2% to start cutting rates. We all know that. Um, but what I thought, so this was my mistake, you guys, I thought that we had to have unemployment closer to five because. If you look at the history of the unemployment charts, it's around five is kind of neutral, right? That's a pretty stable market. The Fed's saying that they're they're they don't think it's going to go over four point one percent in the next four. I think it's four years, maybe three years, three to four years. It won't go barely go over four, but they still think they're going to get PCE core to two. So I guess I was wrong, and it sounds like what you're saying, Mike, is what the Fed agrees also. Yeah, and so the number to look at really is more of the um, the employment participation rate. I don't remember what that number would be, but it's the unemployment part- participant rate. Last I looked at, and I have not looked at this in a couple months, but it was up in the mid-teens. Of people that are capable of working, and there's no reason why they're not working, but they're not reporting any W-2, and that's what they rely on. But look at how many people don't need a W-2 anymore because we're taking 1099s or they're living off the, the government um, subsidies. You know, and I don't remember where I've heard it, but I know I've heard heard it and I've never looked into it to, to identify it, but over 50% of the population is, is receiving some sort of government subsidy. Pay no taxes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're supporting them. Yeah, and get, you- and get a refund check. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Sean, what do you I hear I hear a lot like let's don't buy right now. Rates are really high. In fact, there are surveys out there that say 80%, right? I think that's the number 80% of potential first-time buyers won't buy because now's not a good time. They that's how they feel. What do you say to your clients that are like, should I sit on the sidelines? Should I go out and do a transaction? What what should we be looking at in this environment? Well, when it comes to in, in the investing side of it, I mean, may, yeah, maybe for a first time home buyer, you know, if they're if they're not in a huge hurry to to get into a property, maybe hold off and see if rates come down. I mean, that's I guess that's their their uh, their mo essentially. But as far as investors go. I mean, we've said this for years. It doesn't matter what is really going on in the market. It, it seems like it's always a good time to buy as an investor because if you're if you're doing for a flip, you're still able to turn them. Like we were saying, we're seeing the them starting to move a little quicker again. Um, and if you're you're looking to hold them for a rental property, I mean, you're still you're still going to be cash flowing even at a little bit higher interest rate. And and you can always refinance it down if the rates do come back down, you know? So I don't, I don't see any reason why investors shouldn't be buying right now. Um, you know, to be honest, it, maybe these are scaring people off. We listen to the media, people are getting scared off. Maybe you got a little bit easier time buying right now as an investor, you don't have as many people competing for them. But well, in my sense of that, it's I never bought, a bad time to buy. I bought more houses in the, this last six months than I did the last two years combined. Yep. It's easier to buy houses now. Yeah. And the irony, kind of back to what we were saying before, how, how I was saying that I'm, I'm seeing the the properties that are being flipped that are moving a little bit quicker again. The irony is, you know, a lot of these people are basing it on what we saw two years ago, which was a unicorn. I mean, things were moving as 
faster than they ever should have, you know, and, and rates were, or people were paying, uh, you know, more than they, than the appraised value of the property and rates were significantly low and everything else. But based on the Nash or on the, uh, the average over time, we're still under, you know, the, the whole time that would normally be on a, on a property selling, you know, over, over history. So it's, that's the irony of me. It's still moving quick, even though people don't feel like it is moving as quick as it should be, you know. The Real Estate Educators Podcast is brought to you by Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial Group is a private lender specializing in value add bridge lending for real estate investors. This is accomplished by raising private money from individual investors and lending that money out in short term real estate loans. Pine operates one of the coolest public mortgage funds on the market because it brings consistency and security to your investment portfolio without giving up on returns. The fund pays its investors a flat 8% return with monthly distributions. There is a low minimum investment and no lockup period. That's right. You can request all of your money back at any time without any fees. Diversify your portfolio out of Wall Street and into Main Street with the Pine Financial Group Public Fund, PFG Fund 5. Find out more at pinefinancialgroup.com. That's pinefinancialgroup.com. Yeah, two things there. So I think NAR put out, um, I'm looking at it right here, 3.4 months of inventory nationally. So that's that's well below a, a neutral market. That's definitely still a seller's market, um, assuming this is true. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to, sh- to say about what you just said, but I can't think of it. But yeah, months of inventory is a great way to look at great stat in fact it's my favorite one because it it tries to combine supply and demand into one number so it takes the absorption rate how quickly it's things are moving and what's on the supply what's on the market currently um so i don't know you want to throw up some slides here mike i met you have the months of inventory in your your stack there i do let me um Oh, I was going to say this while he's pulling that up, Sean. This one, the other thing just get popped back in my mind. So you said now's a good time to buy. Don't wait for lower interest rates. You can still cash flow. You can still flip all of that. I, I, I believe all of that. Um, but if if rates go down, do you think you're, that will have an impact on property values? So if I'm if I'm a buyer and I'm I'm going to wait till it's more affordable, I'm going to wait for interest rates to go down. Do you think I might be buying a property at a higher price when the rates come down, or do you think that will stay pretty flat? You know, I, I think until rates do come down, it, might, it I don't know that it will stay flat, but I don't think it'll increase as rapidly. But if rates come down and people start jumping back out there to buy, I think that does drive the value back up. But it all depends on how much the rates do come down is the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it could create more demand, right? So yeah, now exactly. You're competing, now you're going to be competing with other people that are doing the exact same thing, waiting, right? And then I hate the term, I hate it, but I'm going to say it anyways. We hear it all the time: date the rate, right? Yeah. You could, you could, you could break up with the rate when the rates do go down and refinance your property. So there's always that as well. Yeah. All right, Mike, you're up. Well, that that at? brings up a question I've been actually meaning to ask you guys: Are you seeing a significant? Uh, change in the number of clients, how their their exit strategy. Because I'm wondering if beforehand, like two years ago, if the average exit strategy was to burr the property, refinance it, like you just said, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Compared to just flipping it for a flat out resale. That's a that's a good question. Do you, we don't you guys even track that. We don't track that, and that's maybe one of our that maybe that is something we should track. But um, and I'm I'm one step removed here. So Sean, you're in the trenches. What are you? What are your clients doing? Well, to be honest, it, you know it, what I'm what I'm actually seeing is the people that typically would be just the fix and flip investor. I'm actually seeing more of them. Um, have that plan B as a birth strategy if the market does slow at all, <clears throat> excuse me, if the market does slow at all, instead of them sitting and waiting, you know, and, until um, until someone does snatch it up or even waiting for a spring market, I'm seeing more of them say, you know what, I'm just gonna make sure that I've got the ability to refinance this out if if it comes to that. 
there's exit strategy still is to flip it, but I'm seeing more of them say, I'm just going to make sure I've got this plan B versus I'm going straight ahead with a flip no matter what. And but I'm wondering if that's reverse. If, if prior to two years ago when the rates started going up, was a lot of the because the people that I, my members that I talked to and they were going to you guys for the loans, mm -hmm. most of them are saying, Well, yeah, I'm gonna, I got a loan from, um, from Sean and I'm gonna refinance, you know, with Kim. Yep. Once I got the rehab done. So yep. I, you know, the, the loan from, from Pine Financial to do the renovation and then I'm refinancing the loan to pay off Pine Financial and they're gonna hold on to his rental. I'm wondering if that's flipped and maybe their backup strategy at that time was, well, if I can't get the refinance because something happens, I'll just sell it. Yeah, that's a good question because I, I do have a few clients that were strictly building a portfolio like that, doing the birth strategy. And, and I've got a couple of them now where they've just gone to selling them off now instead of looking to hold them with that backup as a hold if they need to. But as of right now, they're just selling them off. So that is, yeah, that's a good point. Um, if their if their main strategy was to burn it before, I am seeing a few that are starting to dump them instead. Um, but I do still have some that they're just sticking to it, and that's their strategy. They're just going to keep building portfolio no matter what the rate is, as long as the cash flows for now. So right, and that's my strategy too. I'm building my portfolio yeah. as long as the cash flows. Yeah, and my backup strategy is always a refinance. My, sure. but my entry is never to go get a loan. Now, I mean a bank loan. Yeah, I don't use bank loans. I use either private money or I use my own cash to, to for my entry, and then I'll I'll either refinance it or I'll sell it as my my exit strategy. Sure, but I got one right now where my entry was to hold on to it uh, that I picked up a couple months ago, and then when we were digging into it we found more problems than I anticipated. And I'm now into it for about $70,000 out of my pocket. I'm like, even refinance, I'm not going to refinance it because now it won't cash flow. So mm -hmm. I'm going to just flat out resell it. Sure. But I'll probably sell it on the contract for deed because that's how I sell things. I, I either want the rental income or I want the cash flow from the holding the paper on it. Mm -hmm. So I'll do one of those two. But as I got these numbers up here if you guys are... Dive yeah, so yeah, right away. this this does go up on on YouTube, so it'll be quite a few people watching it. But let's uh, let's just try to explain what we're looking at here, Mike. Yeah, so this is a weekly um, report. So this I get this from the Minneapolis Area Association of Realtors. Um, they provide this data for free to anybody. So if anybody wanted to go to you know mplsrealtor.com and then go to the market data. That's where I'm pulling all this data from. They do a really, really good job of providing the data. And this is my primary source for our local market data is from the Minneapolis Area Association of Realtors. And I look at both the weekly and the monthly. Um, and like when I do our reports and stuff for our, our monthly meeting at Minaria, I'm always using a monthly number. But when we do these smaller one-offs like this, I can go by with the uh, weekly activity as opposed to the monthly. You do get more, more information in the monthly, but you get more timely information in the weekly. So the weekly is just a smaller report that they put out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and like the median price right now, no, that's the foreclosure one. The median price right now is coming in at, let me scroll down to the median, around 360, yeah, 362.6 is the median price for the month of November. Now they the median price is always based on the month anyways. It's not showing the weekly activity. But the median price has been going up. Now it's down from the previous couple months, which is typical because our our peaks, our seasonal peaks is going to be in June and July and our seasonal lows are usually going to be in January and February. Right? So it's following a very consistent line. And for those that are looking on the on the computer screen and you can see the chart here it's showing the the peaks in the valleys but it's also got this extra little gray line in here which is showing you the average or the median annual price and you can see it's on a consistent trajectory up and this year once the rates started hitting it started to flatten out mm -hmm. and that's kind of what i'm expecting to happen for the near future as well to just stay flat the only thing i really see changing that is for the interest rates to go down. If the rates go down, then I expect this to continue to go up. 
if the rates stay where they're at, which is what the Fed's saying, and which we were talking about earlier, if they stay where they're at, or even come down a little bit, but not a lot, I expect this to stay kind of flat. That's my my prediction at this moment. But the things to look at is really is what's coming on the market for inventory. And so we go back up to the, the new listings. Just over the last, this, this chart here is just showing us over the last three months. And it's really down. So like just this last week or a week ago, there were 733 act, uh, new listings in one week. That's for the whole entire Twin Cities of a population of three and a half million. And I think for our total MSA for our area is closer to five million. Mm -hmm. 733 new listings for the whole entire Twin Cities MSA area. This is that's really, really, really low. Right. It's half of what it was even three months ago, but that's just extremely low inventory for new listings. And that's what's been our biggest issue is and you can see on the chart, it's got that historical chart going back to 2006. You can see how it's just been trending down. <clears throat> so we have our seasonally adjusted ups and downs, like these low peaks, these are gonna be our, our, our lows. And these are gonna be right around the December timeframe. And you can see that if, you can, if you're looking at the screen, you can see that, that the lows almost always correspond with the January mark on the, on the chart. And then the peaks always, almost always correspond with the June, July mark. Mm -hmm. But the trend line has been going down for the since 2006, as far back as this goes. Now, I've actually been working with running these numbers um, for going on probably 30 years now. Because when I first got started in real estate, you guys probably don't even know this story. When I first got started in real estate, I, I I was interested as an investor, but I didn't. We didn't have a RIA around here, so my backup plan after struggling for a year or so trying to figure this thing out, realized and I the, the I didn't know enough information, so I went and got my real estate license, and I ended up working with Burnout Realty. Well, Burnout Realty in the Twin Cities was one of the forerunners of the MLS system. So if you, I don't know if you guys were around back then, but if you remember the MLS system was books, so if you yeah. weren't there, you probably have heard the stories. Yeah. So weekly, we would get these books brought in. And so then I was working with the, um, because I, but my background I went to school was for computers. And we were in the infancy of the PC, and, um, PC or the computer, personal computer revolution back in the early nineties. And so I had the background of working with the computers and, I love doing anything I could with computers. So I got recruited to actually help them pull data from the MLS, from the, the books and try to figure out a way to get it into a computer system. So we had our first, Burnet Realty created our own <clears throat> um, MLS system, but it was portable. So we were taking what was the data that was coming from the books, which we were digitizing. And then it was, we were creating a database that we would be able to download and put on our laptops at that time. We didn't have phones back then, so it was on our laptops. So I've been following this stuff ever since then, those those days. So I, I learned how to um, look at these numbers and analyze these numbers and know where we should be at. The big thing I've noticed is the, the supply and demand lines have been shifting. They should be going up, but they've been going down. So that I haven't figured out why. I've been, I've been following a lot of people. I've been talking to a lot of people, seeing if I can get a handle on it. <clears throat> Because all the indications are that we should be in a recession, but like we were saying earlier, physically we don't see it. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't really a recession what we feel, and is it more so than what the numbers are telling us? That's my impression. Because <clears throat> I don't know what a recession is anymore, Mike. I is changing. <laughs> I know the definitions are changing. That's why everyone's I'm like, oh, because the Fed's doing this, and you know this is historically how it's been. Well, well, yeah, but everything's been changing. So it, we have to come up with these new, because the Fed's purchased so much money and they've given, even last week, they gave us the indication that they are they have no plans of stopping, right? Their only concern is they keep the inflation on, in check. They have to keep printing money because it's the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of Ponzi. They are printing money to pay interest on debt. And... I'm going to go on a little rant here because this drives me absolutely crazy. You think interest rates are going to stay high for 
they're saying higher for longer, which I actually agree with, but devil's advocate, it can't because the higher interest rate hurts themselves mm -hmm. because they, their government debt is expensive. They can't even afford to pay it. Right. right. So I don't know. Well, when we say higher for longer, I don't think we're going to see the 1980s higher interest rates. So I don't think yeah, they've said, I mean, they publicly said there it's going to be a very gradual decrease. And I, I, I spit out those projections of what the Fed said. I just saw, I saw that this morning. They are, they are projecting now this changes with data, right? So they have the, the flexibility to change. They're projecting three cuts for 75 basis points next year and another 100 basis points the following year. So you're talking about over a two year period, 1.75%, which is a fraction of how high they, they, they went. In, in one year period of time. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So I, I do want to mention this to the listener here. I'm looking at your historic listings, and, and Mike's got up on the screen here from 2006. So right through the uh, credit crash, and that, that's basically what created the previous inventory, new inventory low. Looks like, Mike, tell me if I'm wrong here, but maybe 2012. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a seasonally adjusted here. I'm only looking at the peaks. The inventory so we're low, at, I would say, is going to be probably 2018. Oh, so if I'm only looking at the peaks, I'm trying to... Oh, peaks. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking at the peaks, it's like June of 2012. So was 2012 the was the previous. And now if I'm looking at twenty the, the, the peak in 2023, that looks well, pretty damn close. I can't, I don't know what the numbers are, but it might even be lower now than it was during the credit crash. It's pretty darn close either way. Actually, no, I, you're, I'm looking at, I got a little bit better view on I can even zoom it in and I can probably even go back. I, I might have those numbers actually in another program. Yeah, no, well, I my only point here track. is that we're in a, like we're in an inventory crisis. Like that is a real thing. We are at like, historic lows right now. Yeah, I got back till 2000 and okay, so I've been tracking this is not, this is available on the Minria site. So every month I go and grab these numbers and I update them into the Minria website. So Minria members can come look at this at any time. So I do have that here. So we're looking for new listings. Let me get rid of these other items here. And I can literally see when our low was for inventory. Our 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 peak low. So in Mm -hmm. In April of 2012, we were at 6,500. That's in the heart of the crash. And our peak for 2000 and, or 2023 was on June 1st, and that was 6,700. So, yeah, it was, we're That's just close. about that right Very there. close. It's still a little bit lower. And here's the other interesting thing. 2012 was the low was the median price low as well from from January or February of 2012 prices have been going up consistently ever since that day and our inventory is back down to that same level yeah when I say the hard I really 2010 was the absolute worst year for that recession but I mean 2012 wasn't far off from it and that recession lasted many many years so we it was definitely in the recession. Mm -hmm. one uh, in 2012 well and where i noticed the 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 change in activity because i started buying again in 2000 and late 2010 because the prices had gotten down so low that yeah. we were buying properties and flipping them at that point and we were selling them at prices but we were still selling them for less than we were buying you know renovated than we were buying them for just a few years before that so we we're buying them super cheap from the banks well i noticed in 2004 14 so two over two years later that was the first time i really started noticing a drying up of the inventory and more competition in the market because it seemed like from for about two to three years i was the only one that had the guts to get back in the market and i had nobody to compete with me if i wanted to buy a property i just opened up the mls and i was the only one looking at properties on, on the mls by 2015 i couldn't buy a property because every I mean, if I if I went to if I got up in the morning, went to breakfast, and then went and looked at houses, the, the good ones are already sold because everyone else was now looking at them, and yeah. they were selling that quick. And values, 2012 values were definitely in the recovery. So right. So let's get back to uh, 
this. So and we're looking at inventory. The, the inventory is going down. So is the pending sales. That's going down precipitously as well. I would expect to see a little bit of a bump now coming up in the next few weeks because of the the rates dropping. But his, so what I've noticed, and I've looked at this historically when it comes to interest rates and how they correlate to transactions, when the rates go up, the market stop for a while, for about six months. And as long as they don't keep going up, but they stay flat, about six months, the activity gets back to normal. So there's that that lag effect. But when they go down, activity activity picks back up almost instantly. Because you get all these people that are waiting, 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 and they see the rates come down a little bit. Now they're going to jump in. Yeah. And if the rates have been flat for a while, if they went up and then stayed flat for a while, then people have been holding off, hoping it's going to come down. It's like, it's not coming down. Let's just jump in now. Right. And then uh, inventory of homes for sale. This is the big one. Look at that. Yeah, decline. It's a very steep decline for the listener. Yeah, so we went we went from just three in the last three months. We went from a little over nine thousand. We went from a peak of looks like nine thousand seventy six uh, houses for sale at any given time to currently we're sitting at seven thousand seven hundred twelve. So and that's bringing us into what two months? Let me go down. Do we have the month supply of inventory on this chart? Yeah, month supply of inventory is sitting at 2.1. Okay, and that's based on 7,700 houses for sale. Right. Well, so that, is, that, is that just in Minneapolis or is it the surrounding metro? This is the whole entire, this was the Twin Cities MSA. Got it. All right, so this is, you know, yeah. covering three, three and a half to four, maybe five, up to five million. I don't know what the population is in our MSA. I know the Twin Cities is you know and the surrounding suburbs and the immediate like the seven counties or something like seven or nine counties is like three and a half million but mm -hmm. this is the msa which is a bigger broader it goes out to st cloud goes into hudson wisconsin um down to rochester so it's covering you know, everything half of the entire state of minnesota and that so to put this in perspective here 2.1 an average i mean an average uh a pretty neutral market is somewhere between four and five. If you look at the charts and you're trying to find like an right. average, so we so let's call it four and a half. Um, that means the seller doesn't have an advantage and the buyer doesn't have an advantage. It's neutral for about four and a half. So 2.1 is less than half of a neutral market. That means that is a strong indicator of strength. I don't, I don't, well, well, it's a strong indicator, but I'm not sure of strength. It's still in the seller's favor, but because these rates are changing. Now we talked about this last month that are, uh, or no, not last month, two months ago. Oh, when I say strength, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mike, but when I say strength, you're not going to see a 2008 crash, right? We're not going to see a market crash at 2.1 months of inventory. Correct. That, that's my opinion as well. That's, uh, but now I've, I've had a couple other people say, well, you, you're looking at the wrong things, Mike. And that might be, um, but this is a really strong indicator, as like you said, as to the strength of the market itself, because 2.1 months worth of inventory at at 7,700. Let me go back up to what our uh, inventory level was. Yeah, 7,700. Right for the Twin Cities to be like Kevin was saying at a neutral market, where it's because we're anything less than four. So four to five months, just I'll just use easy, easy math. We'll call it four months. That's double what we have here. Yeah. Right. And I haven't seen double this number since 2012. Where's the inventory going to come from? That That's one of my biggest points. Like we need inventory. And if you're going to see a softening in the markets, like, and this goes to Sean's point earlier, now's a good time to buy because how can the market soften when you have 2.1 months of inventory? I just I just don't see where the inventory is going to come from to double that number. No, we I am seeing in other markets around the country because like I said I'm I'm tuned in with all these other areas around the country, other markets that the the builders did overbuild in areas like in Florida Austin, and yeah. in Texas and in areas where mm -hmm. people were moving out of. And the statistics were all showing that, hey, people are moving to these other areas that are a lot more freer and, and you know, more uh, lenient towards entrepreneurs and conservatives. 
and people were moving to those areas and the builders i think picked up on that and they started overbuilding and if you look back at our market here in minnesota and in colorado if you look back in 2006 7 time frame our biggest problem back then was we had too much inventory i mean we were i i was looking at some older charts i think we were sitting around well actually right down here you can see we're the historical inventory levels in the Twin Cities was closer to 40,000 prior to the market crash. So when the subprime market hit and, and, and it blew up and property started going into foreclosure, the reason was is because people had all these opportunities. And people ask me because I lost my shorts in 2008. And I had almost 50 properties. And people like, well, how could you have lost all that, all that property? How, I mean, what? how bad of an investor were you that you could have let that happen? <laughs> and like, because the the investors that were, had the properties across the street or the homeowners that had the property across the street from me, my, my tenants didn't move across town. They moved to the house right next door that they could get on a monthly basis for a one third of what I was charging them beforehand. And 50% of what I could actually lower my number down to. Because people, they were asking me, hey, Mike, I'd love to stay and help you out can you but can you lower your payment down to eight hundred dollars and we're at 17 i'm like no because my payment my mortgage payment is 15. oh well i can get this one at 800. what do you do so yeah, all do you... my tenants did that all my tenants all my contract for deed buyers they all did that because there was so much inventory and because there was so much inventory the prices plummeted yeah well we don't have that inventory overabundance of inventory here in, the, in our market but I have talked to a couple of the Rios where that they are experiencing that right now. They're experiencing like what we did here in 2006 and seven with our inventory levels. They're experiencing no, not to the same height, but the same types of, of situations in these smaller markets around the country where we are hearing from the, the YouTube doomsayers, clickbaiters um, saying, oh yeah, market's crashing, market's crashing. Here's the evidence, market's crashing. And they're all they're cherry picking the data for these little markets that have been overbuilt. Yeah, and they're also coming out and apologizing for making a mistake. <laughs> We're starting to see that now. Yep, we are starting to see that. All right, we gotta probably get this wrapped up. Is there any other important things we want to share about the Twin Cities market here, Mike? Uh, one note, one interesting thing. I've been following this for a little while, and this is the foreclosures. Um, the number of foreclosures in the Twin Cities market, because that's the other thing people were like, are we going to have more foreclosures? I was looking at these earlier. Where did that go? Inventory. Okay. So this chart is a little confusing because it's showing you traditional and lender owned and short sales. So the big, the big blue um, boxes over here on the left, that's traditional sales, right? So for new listings for the, for the month of November so far. But then in the middle, and there's just this little flat lines with a couple numbers on there. But in 2021, there's only 24 foreclosures in the Twin Cities. In 2022, there's only 23 foreclosures in the Twin Cities. But this year in November, that number has gone up 117% to a whopping number of 50, but it's over doubled the number of foreclosures. So we're now just now starting to see the foreclosures happen. And I've had this conversation with a lot of uh, realtors and lenders in the last probably year, and I'm always picking their brain to say, hey, why, what are you guys seeing? Because the thing that we saw coming out of 2008 was there was a lot of people that, that got mod modification. So the, before the banks, so for history, before the banks could even foreclose after a point, the, the uh, I think it was the Obama administration implemented a um, an, an act or some regulation or maybe just a, hey, please do this, but all the lenders followed suit. And they literally had to, to go through a modification process before they were allowed to file the foreclosure. Well, something like, and I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the neighborhood of 80 to 90% of all modifications within a year and a half went back into default and then ended up going through the foreclosure anyway, which is why that foreclosure process coming out of 2008, we all expected to be bled through by 2010 and it took to almost 2015 because of all those modifications. Well, look at all the loans that in the last two years have gotten modifications coming out of COVID, mm. right? 
how many of those are going into default? And everyone's like, oh no, the market's fine. Everything's gonna be okay. Everyone, nobody went into foreclosure, which we all expected they were gonna go into foreclosure. Then when we learned that, no, they're gonna modify all the loan, which, you know, I, and I've taken over several of those in the last, you know, year or two here where there were those modifications, but I'm just now starting to talk to sellers that are now in default on their, on, on their loans again. And the interesting thing is, is how in the world can you be in default with most of those modifications were zero payments, zero interest seconds that were added back to the loans. So they, they just kept your loan payment where it was. And I'm already starting to see people like I just, in fact, I just got a PA accepted last night from somebody exact same situation. They got their modification and now they can't afford the payments again. So I'm getting their house subject to right now. That's very interesting. So <clears throat> you're, this is going to be an unpopular opinion, Mike. So please don't hate me for this, but clickbait. 117% increase in foreclosures. Yeah, but you're starting at 23. Right. So it, for the listener, we're looking at new listings for traditional. And he said he described it as big blue boxes or big a blob of blue or whatever. So the number is 3601. Okay. And then you have 50 listed for like a fraction of what the new listings are as foreclosures. So this doesn't scare me at all. Um, I think it's gonna be healthy if that if we see that increase. I, I hate to see people going to foreclosure, but I think it's good for the market. So I, this doesn't this doesn't intimidate me, um, not even a little. I, I think we need more inventory. So if Actually, that inventory is gonna come through foreclosures and then so be it, but I, I just don't see because we're, we're still at all time record in, in equity. Do you know that the average equity is is uh, over 60%? So the average loan to value is like 40-ish percent, a little under 40%. I mean, that. how do you have a foreclosure crisis when you have that? Right. That's my point. So this these numbers actually excite me. That It is such a small fraction of it, but we are starting to see that number tick up. And that's where the deals are going to come from from the investors, at least for me. No, I agree with you. And, and you and I, we do agree on this. I, I think subject twos and contract for deeds and all those creative strategies, this is absolutely the right time to be doing those because you're going to be taking over payments that were originated, loans originated a year or two ago. At so between three, yeah, three and four percent. Yeah. Yeah. The one I just got the PA on, PA on last night, it's, they got a second mortgage for their, their COVID with no payments, no interest, just got to be paid off when the house is sold. But the underlying loan is at three <laughs> percent. I got, and I got. I want to say I picked up in the last six months. I probably picked up half a dozen of them under three percent. So that, that I love yes. it. I, I do agree a hundred percent. Creative financing is back. This is the time to be learning about it. This is the time to be implementing it. Mike, are you are you teaching this in your in your club? Or oh yes. In fact, I just. Stuff? I just changed our topic for last month to subject twos again because that's the number one question I'm getting from people is how do you do subject two? So okay, we're gonna close out here, but you're on the cutting edge. You've been through this. You more unlike a lot of investors went through 2008. A lot of a lot of people, it's been roses and rainbows the entire time they've been in the industry. So to find someone that's back that's gone through it before um, is huge. I could be a great mentor. I don't know if you're doing a ton of mentoring right now, but you definitely have the club. So how do we get a hold of you? Uh, just find us on Minria, M-N-R-E-I-A.com. Sean, any closing words here? No, I just, I, I want to just reiterate what we talked about before. I mean, as investors, I don't, don't sit on the sideline. It's, it's always a good time to buy. And, and when you've got low inventory like this, you're, you're going to move the properties when you get them rehab. So, um, yeah, I, I just I wouldn't I wouldn't sit idle watching the interest rates. I would still be interested in in getting out there and buying more properties. And like Mike was saying, I mean he's snatching up properties using creative strategies now. Um, it, there's so many avenues to get properties. It, just don't sit on the sideline and wait. Just do it. Yeah, go out there and get educated. I'm gonna agree, I'm agree with you. Go out there and get educated and you know, take the action. Yeah. Um. So hopefully we can get you guys back. Absolutely. near the end of q oh yeah no problem. Year. so we'll get this we'll get this published quickly it'll be before christmas for sure um maybe even tomorrow tomorrow next day something like that so 
I like getting it out quick because the, the information that we're providing is relevant now, right? And it yeah. does change. So we'll get this out as soon as possible. I want to thank you both so much for coming on. We'll do it Q1 2024. And with that, I'm going to wish the viewers, the listeners, a fantastic day and happy holidays. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did, please be sure to follow and leave us a review. Oh yeah, and tell a friend.